What we're going to do today is we're going to go through just some basic employment law rights and facts. I'm then going to lead you through how to, well, not how to have a difficult conversation with your manager, but just dealing with difficult conversations. Because what I see more and more of is people who are now working from home but feel quite isolated or who are off sick and feel quite isolated and don't really know how to navigate even initiating a conversation with their manager because they're fearful that it will lead to, I don't know, a dismissal or a change in their rights or something, you know, their, their contractual rights. So I'm going to spend a wee bit of time on that as well. And then we should have time for questions at the end. OK, so the starting point, I'd say, for the legal area for people who deal in, have a disability, which is something related to if you have a condition of... Um, a sorry, aplastic anemia. I can never say that properly. It's terrible. And um, this could or could not, and I'll get on to why it might not, um, be considered a disability under the Equality Act 2010. And in the Equality Act, there's certain characteristics that are protected. Um, disability is one of them. Sex would be another. Race, age, um, marriage, and civil par partnership. Gender reassignment, which is probably the trendiest one at the moment, I would say, um, is also protected religion and belief and sexual orientation. So they would all be protected characteristics under the Equality Act. So if you qualified as being disabled, you would have the protection of that act and you could go to tribunal um, citing that there's been a breach of that act um, if, if there was a, a workplace um, concern with it. So just briefly, there are like different types of discrimination and people are most probably most aware of direct discrimination. So that's you were treated, you were treated in a certain way because of, and I'm just sticking to disability because it, it could be any of the protected characteristics. So you didn't get that promotion because you have a disability, which meant you had six months off work. And they said, well, it's because you had that six months off. That's directly because of your disability that you didn't get that job. OK, and then there's indirect discrimination, which is that an employer will put in place a provision criteria or practice, which pe puts people who have a particular like protected characteristic, say sex, for example, at a disadvantage and that they cannot justify the reason for this, this thing that they've got in place. So for example, quite often, and it's not as common now, I have to say, but quite often employers would say, everyone has to work nine to five, five days a week. And that would put women, more women than men at this advantage because women still are the principal carers for children. So that would be, and, and if they can't, so I've had situations where I've gone to court and the employer has been able to justify that the reason for this nine to five, five days a week. And I haven't won that case, but more often than not, you, especially in nowadays, post COVID people working from home, everything was much more flexible. They have to be able to justify the reason for this provision criteria or practice. And then we go into harassment, which I always struggle with this because I think people should know better in this day and age. You should know better not to call people names, uh, make fun of a particular, like, uh, for example, a disability, make fun of a woman because, or, you know, yeah, a woman because she wears short skirts or, you know, talk about her anatomy or how thin or fat she is or whatever. Um, I, I find it very shocking, maybe too, because I've done this job for so long. Shocking is maybe too strong, but I find it quite bizarre that people still continue to act in this way at work when it's everywhere that most people know like for me most people come to me and say oh we can't say anything anymore so for someone to I don't know touch someone or say something inappropriate about I had a case once where um that a person was on crutches because they had a problem with their ankles and their manager said oh my god we can't do anything because we're all just going to trip over your crutches and it was just like, and then they, he also put them in the back room because he was like, nobody wants to look at you looking like that. I mean, that's a genuine case, which if I was on the other side, I wouldn't have run it to court. But anyway, so, you know, people still do that. I suppose that's why lawyers are still in jobs, but people still um, harass people at work. 
Um, so, and there's also victimization. So if, for example, you'd raised a discrimination grievance at work and then, and then whatever happened with the grievance is fine, but then your line manager or someone else in the business treated you in a, like to your detriment because you had raised that grievance or because you'd helped someone else who'd raised a dis uh, discrimination grievance, that could be victimization. And then lastly, there's um, discrimination arising from your disability. So if, for example, you need to take medication at a certain time every day, your medication, it's, it strictly has to be at those times, like insulin, for example, and then your link or your employer changes your um, hours of work and then that mucks up your, your um, medication intake. You could say, well, and then they didn't, you know, go back to your original hours. You could say this is discrimination because I'm suffering a detriment from something arising from my disability. Okay, so that's quite legal. I promise the rest of it won't be as legal. She says, and then she, you, I probably will go into something else. But um, Sam and I talked before, um, and it's quite an interesting topic. This, and I don't. Well, maybe I just find it interesting because I'm a bit of a nanorack when it comes to this sort of thing, but. It's whether or not um, aplastic anemia counts as a disability. And there's certain um, illnesses that will automatically count as a disability. So cancer, Parkinson's disease. Um, I'm just trying to think of ones off the top. MS, you know, all those multiple cirrhosis, lots of um, illnesses like that would automatically qualify as a disability. And then you would get the protection from the Equality Act. But... And again, until Sam and I spoke, I didn't really know an awful lot about this condition. So it can be, and Sam, correct me if I'm wrong, it can be quite mild symptoms to very, very severe symptoms. Is that, that's correct, isn't it? Yeah, okay. So if you had mild symptoms and you were only off work for a certain amount of time or you were, didn't take time off work and your um, symptoms could be controlled through medication or different things, I'm not sure you would be covered under the disability sorry the Equality Act for disability discrimination. Whereas if you could not function as a result of your illness or you had to be hospitalized and it's a, a condition that could go on for longer than 12 months, then I think you would likely to be covered as disabled. Employers sometimes, they don't do it so much nowadays, but sometimes will, if you raise a claim for disability discrimination, will say you're not disabled and you would then have to prove. And it's interestingly, um, the judge at the employment tribunal that decides whether you're disabled, not a medical person. So that's a bit ironic, but there's a legal test to make that decision as to whether or not you're disabled. And I had one once where it's actually a mental health issue. And I know that my person was definitely disabled in terms of the act and the judge didn't understand it. And he said no. And we had to appeal it. And then it had to go to appeal and then back to the employment tribunal to then be heard again because the judge decided wrongly. So it's it's very, yeah, it's, it's quite, it can be tricky. So if it's one of these ones that you're, you know, you're not too ill, but you're ill enough and you're off, it's, it's not necessarily a given that you would be protected as disabled. Okay. But, but I'm not saying that if you are receiving poor treatment at work and you think it's as a result of your condition, I would always raise a grievance citing disability discrimination. I would always use that as my first instance because the, the employer has to take that one seriously. OK. Does anybody have any questions? I, I know I, I speak really fast, so I'm trying not to. But does anybody have any questions just now? No. Okay. So, so today, so that's a kind of the law bit out of the way. And I, what I wanted to do is just like take it from a different angle today. And I think that's maybe because I have been doing more coaching with individuals recently, and I've been seeing a pattern of individuals being really fearful. And that I think that is the right word to use of approaching their manager or their employer, depending on what the size of the business is to have a conversation about their illness or about their condition, or also if they're a carer about the person they care for and how that's impacting on their work-life balance or their ability to do their job. Um, so 
I've been doing training recently with um, managers to try and educate them as to how, you know, how to deal with, how to have these conversations with employees. So I'm going to look at what I would advise an, a manager to do. So I think sometimes it's quite good for you to be kind of armed with what you know they should be doing. And I'm also going to speak about how I think you should handle a conversation in, in the workplace as well. OK, so I have five C's that I deal with with managers in compassionate conversations, and that is care, courage, curiosity, collaboration. And then up, up, in, in the middle of all that is the centre. So I'm just going to have a quick chat about each of these. And then you, I don't know, I don't know if any of you are facing problems at work or you're concerned about something. So I'm going to just cover these as, as my experience of dealing with them. Um, so let's look at care, first of all. And for me, care from a manager would be that they show empathy and compassion for an individual. And I think that should be a given, but it's not. And it's not always a given. Sometimes employer employees who are undergoing I've I've dealt with a lot of cancer patients that have been undergoing chemotherapy treatment aren't quite sure how to approach their line manager about when they need to take time off for chemo or when they can come back to work and it quite often means that they'll just take the whole like the whole time of the treatment plan off when they actually are really frustrated because they could be at work but they don't know how to approach um, the employer about that so if I was saying to a manager, you you know, you're going to sit down and have some a face to face with this individual. First of all, you need to spend the right amount of time with that person. You need to sit down and that person knows that they're going to be listened to and not that they're rushing off at the end of it. And, and again, that should be a given, but it's not. Um, the person should feel safe um, in the environment that they're in. Um, you should also like try and understand what's wrong with the individual. That's And, and I think that's maybe something with you, this charity that's really important because it, people don't really understand what the condition is and what the implications of it are and you know what it, what it means for you in terms of sleep or eating or having to go to hospital appointments because people think cancer, okay, I know what that means. But actually with, with you, this charity, I think it is a wee bit more difficult. So you need to be a bit more open with your employer maybe give them some information so that they can understand what it means um and also the other thing that I think managers are very bad at is they don't understand that people are going to get emotional about this I mean these chat these chats are very close to you it's almost you you know telling them something very very personal about yourself and they have to be empathetic and be prepared for that and that's where I think most of these relationships break down because there's a lack of empathy and a lack of understanding so that's the first thing I would say to an employer or a manager to look out for courage is a tricky one I think because courage means that the manager has to also manage so and what, what I mean by that is he, he or she would need to tell you what the company policy and procedure is in relation to sick leave. So it's almost like giving you the rules so that you work within the remit of the rules, because quite a lot of employers are embarrassed about that. They don't want to say, actually, you've only got six weeks full pay. Well, that's quite lucky for some people. Um, and six weeks half pay. They just want to be like, yeah, just go off. It'll be fine. So they need to outline the policies and procedures with you so that you know exactly where you stand. They need to give you clear indication of how long you will be paid. The fact that you'll get holiday pay that will continue to accrue during this time. So a lot, you know, a lot of people don't know that. Um, and whether or not, um, you know, at the if we're having a conversation, the sick pay is about to cease. Because I've had a lot of cases whereby the sick pay has just stopped and the employee wasn't aware of that. Um, and people, the, the employer will say, well, they should have been aware it's six months or whatever. But if you're going through treatment and you're going through this like life changing situation, the last thing you're thinking about or not the last thing, but some, something that might slip your mind is, oh, my goodness. So they need to be aware of when sick pay is going to end. And also a very difficult discussion, which requires courage, is what their death and service benefits looks like, because 
a lot of people don't know that either and they don't know whether to stay. I had a case um, very recently actually and it was uh, an employee who was considering leaving because he didn't have any prospects of going back to work and I said well what's your death and service um, benefit and he didn't know. So we looked into it and actually he had great death and service and he, he, um, he remained an employee and we had a conversation with the employer about this and his widow actually received a lot of money from death and service, which she wouldn't have got if he just left because he was just like, there's nothing, you know, I can't do anything, I can't come back. So it's also having those discussions. Um, curiosity sounds like a strange one, but you need to ask questions about how you're feeling. How do you feel about others in your team knowing about your diagnosis? How do you feel, you know, you know, how would you feel if we let everybody in the department know, you know, so it's also, you know, how are you feeling? What support are you getting at home? Just so that they have a picture of, you know, how you're coping. Um, collaboration. It's, it seems like a given, but it's really not. You need to agree with your line manager or your manager or your employer, whatever, a way of working together so that you're both aware of where you're at in your diagnosis, where you're at in your treatment, where you're at in your return to work plan, what your return to work plan looks like. And they also need to give you, you know, collaboration back. Well, if you came back then, um, that means that I could get someone in for a period of six months. Because we all have maternity leave cover, but not many employers have sick leave cover. I mean, I know it happens, but they don't plan for it the way they would plan for maternity leave. But if you said, look, realistically, I've been told I need to be out of work for six months. That's what I'm planning towards. They could then say, right, okay, we'll, we'll get somebody in to cover your work for that period of time. And that makes a massive difference because it means then there's no griping among colleagues well I'm having to do hard work or I'm having to do this or it's it's very difficult how, not very difficult it's very um, interesting how quickly people become can become resentful of someone who's off sick through no fault of their own so I've had lots of cases whereby teams are almost bullying the person when they come back to work because they've been like well we've had to cover all this for you and it's like well I didn't ask to be sick you know so um, so if we can have open and honest and collaborative conversations about that sort of thing, it really makes a massive difference going forward. And then I would say centre, because you have to be at the centre of it all as a manager and you have to stay grounded and care for the person that's in your team as well as all the others. So it's your job to kind of be in the centre of it all and make sure everything works um, going forward. So that's what I've been teaching Sorry, I got a really dry throat. That's what I've been teaching managers. And it's very interesting. I don't, I'll don't. i ask at the end, I don't really know what your experience is, but it's very interesting how many managers, for me, how many managers don't do any of this um, and actually have not been taught any of this and are actually unaware of this. And I always find it quite shocking because I think all of this could stop a claim up here if you just got it right here then the, the individual the person that's sick or disabled wouldn't feel ignored they wouldn't feel embarrassed about the condition they wouldn't feel like they couldn't come back to work or another one is they wouldn't come back to work early because they feel pressured into coming back to work and then they become more sick and so it, it's all those sorts of things that I just think if we if we did more training now and we were able to, you know, speak openly and honestly. And I think that's, I don't know, I think more people are feeling less inclined to speak openly and honestly since COVID. I don't know why. I don't know if that's because we're at home and we're working from home and we're not in a team environment as much anymore. But I've definitely noticed a shift with that. So I think if you are off sick, going to go off sick, or, you know, you're working or you're helping someone who is off sick and dealing with these issues just now, I think it's really important that everybody is open and honest and tries to have a meaningful conversation that will help both parties. It's not just about one party or the other, it's about both parties working together. And I think that's where managers, they've got everything else that they're managing. They don't really enjoy doing this part of it because it makes them uncomfortable. Okay.
So that's my managers, my tips for managers. So if any of your managers, <laughs> um, remember the five C's. And I also think when people are off sick, there is a manager or an employer's perception of them versus the reality. So by that, I mean perception. How many times have you heard someone say, that's fine, you're going in for treatment. Right, you'll be back in six weeks then. But in actual fact, the reality is, there's no way I'll be back in six weeks. And how many times have you said, oh yeah, six weeks sounds about right, knowing in your head there's no way that'll happen, but you just don't want to upset them or let them down or look like you're not a member of the team. So it's like their perception versus what the reality of the situation is. And it's how we manage their perceptions and the reality. And again, that goes back to having open and honest conversations. Um, so if they said, well, it looks like you're back in six weeks, you just say, actually, look, I, whilst I would love to be, I don't think that's a reality. This is what my um, my medical team have been saying to me. This is, you know, I also, and this is something that's really important as well. I'm also physically unwell, but mentally I'm finding it really difficult to cope with this. So I don't think I will have gone through treatment and be ready to come back in four to six weeks. Whether if, even if physically I might be, mentally I'm not there yet. So you need to really be, because obviously they can't discriminate against you because of a depressive illness or anything like that either. So I think it's very important that you take control of that aspect of things and that you are pushing that and saying, no, actually, because I've done it myself. It's like even give, somebody giving you a deadline, right? You'll get that done by the end of the week. And you're like, yeah, that's fine. And your head going, how the hell am I actually going to manage this? And then you have that whole anxiety I'll need to tell them I can't do this, you know, and that, that also is not going to help you at all in your rehabilitation or where you're going through your treatment because, it, it, you know, it's going to be in your head worrying about it. And then that's also where resentment comes in and it shouldn't, but it does with your manager. Well, you, I, I thought it was four to six weeks. You never told me any different. Well, I haven't got anybody in. The team are on their knees, da, 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 and then somehow it's your fault. So that's where these cases, can, can you see where these cases start to build up? Because there's already that resentment. There's already that little bit of hostility. You're feeling on the back foot because you're like, oh God, I can't do this. And al already that employment relationship is starting to break down a little bit. So it's all about trying to keep the conversations going. So <laughs> I've I, uh, the slide that I've um, I've, I've, I've entitled this slide so what can you do about this and we've talked about all our employers duties as an employee you also have a duty to your employer you can't just say that's me off sick and I'll see you in a year I mean that just wouldn't work um contractually and in terms of your policies and stuff you would all have duties to your employers you might have to share I mean if it was a good employer, they would ask for some medical information so that they understood your condition. So you would have to consent to um, getting medical information so that the employer can see it. Um, and you also have a duty just to keep them informed as to what you're doing. And, you know, when you, know, when you need to take time off for appointments, for example, if you have, you have to go for a blood transfusion every Tuesday, I don't know. That needs to be factored in, and that potentially could be a reasonable adjustment that the employer could make for a period of your treatment. So that, um, and then everybody knows where you are on a Tuesday. It's not like, oh God, she's she's off again. It's Tuesday, and that's you know, and that's where you know people start stop bullying, but it's almost treating you differently. So as long as you are aware, you're up front with the employer, and then if they start, if they are treating you like that, you can be like, well, actually, I've told you, I've been up front, this is downright discrimination, and I'm not happy about it, I'm going to raise a grievance. It gives you a much better stand platform to start with. Um, if you can um, provide regular updates to your line manager, just to let them know where you're at at your treatment, especially if you're off sick, it's really important that you agree with your manager before you go off regular intervals for updates if <coughs> on one of the days you're not able to do that email in or get someone to email in for you saying won't be able to make the update today but can we do it on another day instead but my biggest area of 
um, people raising claims is because the relationship's broken down. The manager doesn't want to contact the individual because they think, well, they're at home, they're not well, the last thing they want to do is hear from me. And the individuals at home saying, well, I haven't heard from them for six months. They obviously don't need me. They don't want me back. I'm just a nuisance and this is awful. So they're just going to get rid of me. And then there's all these things going around in their head. And I know there's a question about this and I'll, I'll answer it later. Can they get rid of me? Can they do this? And it's adding to anxiety that shouldn't be there. So have regular di uh, dialogues that are agreed. I've put, in, I've put in a bit of a big exclamation mark, don't feel guilty, you're sick. I think we have, or maybe human nature is, you, you're like, oh God, I feel so bad, I've got to go in and tell. You know, when you, you go in to resign, you always feel bad unless they've been really terrible to you, but you always feel a bit like, oh, I'm really sorry about that. And I think quite, often, I think when I was pregnant with my second child, I worked in a law firm that was really old fashioned and I had to go in and say I'm really sorry, but I'm pregnant. And I'm like, why, why am I sorry? Because I'm pregnant. And there's quite a similar thing with, I'm really sorry, I'm unwell. I'm coaching this person just now who said they felt so guilty. They were at quite a senior level, so guilty going in and having to say to their team, I can't do this. I need to take some time out. And it was a big project they'd all been working on. And they were all like, well, what are we going to do now? As if it was his fault. So it's that don't have the guilt attached to it. You're ill, it's totally valid, but also don't make promises you can't keep. So this person was then like, <laughs> I'll log on, I'll do this from home, I'm only getting treatment on these days. And then he was getting these emails saying you would say you would do this. And he was like, I think he ended up resigning because he just couldn't face going back because he felt so bad. He felt like he let his team down. And it's not that, but if you're open and honest at the beginning, that situation won't occur. And I'm not saying you're being open and honest and uh, keeping things and it's, you know, it's a big secret. Just, you have to tell that that's your duty so that they understand. Um, I would say consider what would help you and we'll go on to reasonable adjustments in a minute. So what would help you in your return to work? Would, um, I think Sam, we discussed this in the last um, seminar we gave, would working from home for a period help you? Because you don't have to get up, you don't have to get on a bus, you don't have to go into an office. If you feel like you look terrible that day, it doesn't really matter because you're at home. Would, I don't know, working less hours in a week help? You know, so there's different things that you could, so you could go to your employer and say, this is what I've got. I've had a think, this is how long I think I'll be off. I've had a think about what would really help me in my return to work. And that makes that conversation so much easier. As opposed to saying, well, they didn't offer me anything. I mean, I've had people like that say, well, <laughs> they didn't come and see me. They didn't offer me anything. I just thought they didn't care. And I just resigned. And that's me. I'm raising a claim for discrimination. It's like, well, we didn't know what was wrong. You hadn't kept in touch. So there's two, two very distinct sides to that argument. And I've seen this. I've seen huge cases in tribunal. And the nub of it is they didn't speak to each other at the beginning. So that's why these conversations are so important. So maintaining dignity and compassion, something I've put as a slide, because I think sometimes you feel like, oh, it's not very dignified saying what, I mean, I think I'm dealing with a lot of issues with women just now that are going through menopause and they find it very undignified having to say to a male line manager, I'm really unwell because of this. Um, so it's just being honest um, being as open as you can as an as an employer, being empathetic. Again, going back to what I've said earlier, don't make promises that you can't keep. So don't say, yes, I'll definitely be in in six weeks. And when you know fine well, this treatment's lasting 10 weeks. I'm going to be exhausted after it. I'm like really not in a good place in my head coping with this. I need to be honest about this. So don't, you know, cause... Um, you know, people to have you know to, to as I said again not get um covered in because they think it's only going to be four weeks when actually it's six months and then that's causing resentment amongst the team and again see if you don't know a lot of you sound like you're in unions and stuff take ask for ask for help seek advice there's lots of like even citizens advice are really up on this sort of thing ACAS is great it's a great um website for you know if you put in a question They've got all their policies there. Speak to um, an ACAS advisor, for example. Speak to your unions. And if you, you know, if 
you feel that you can afford it and you know you want to take it forward speak to a solicitor maybe I'm biased because I'm a solicitor but we are the ones that know the law the best but the the, the unions are great ACAS are great citizens advice are fine I think they sometimes get it wrong but if, if you're not sure take advice and even come back to um, the charity and just say I'm really struggling with this Sam will know where to road map you Vicky will know where to road people know where to road, road map you to, so you get the right advice because it's so important that you know what your you know what the law is and you know what your rights are because sometimes I think people just think oh I'm just not making a fuss because it's like I'm ill enough I don't want that I'm top of everything else and you know but actually if you don't, then it makes it more difficult further down the line because a judge will say, well, you've put up with this for two years and you're continuing to put up with it. Why are you now just raising a claim about this? Why haven't you raised a grievance? Why haven't you done this? So it's really important that you take advice. Um, so my practical tips are be open and honest. Try and see matters from both perspectives because it's really easy just to see it from your own perspective and just think, why are they not doing this? This is ridiculous. And then that causes, I think, Natalie quite rightly said she felt quite angry but that does cause anger and resentment which can cause a breakdown in the working relationship don't jump to conclusions don't demand changes that are unrealistic but also don't be afraid 